Uh, hello again, welcome back to the uh, Nordic Society of Human Genetics and Precision Medicine webinar series. Uh, we have another great webinar and uh, panel and uh, we'll start in a few minutes. Uh, I'll just, uh, just do a, a few quick uh, housekeeping announcements or, or uh, things just to tell you a few things uh, as soon as I figure out what I'm, how I move my slides forward here. Sorry about this. Um, uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, there are questions we um, would like is that uh, people address some of the questions that uh, Ula and Alex posed ahead of time, uh, but also questions that you you come up with during the webinars. And if you post those down at the bottom in the uh, in the question area, uh, you can upvote or downvote ones that you see that you uh, that you like. Or maybe you can't downvote. You can upvote in any way, so we can. Uh, during the question and answer period afterwards, um, address uh, those questions. And um, the, uh, I think the other thing just to say is the schedule will be, we'll have two talks and then we'll have Q and A from the audience. And then the panel will come in and make comments and it'll be possible to ask questions during the Q and A session as well. And um, we can, um, that time, uh, let's see. Over here, just want to mention that the past web these webinars are recorded, and uh, you can go to our website and you can watch some of the previous ones. Uh, and I think uh, I'll just put this up right now while I uh, begin the introduction. Uh, our two speakers today are um, Al Alexander Alex Fry and Ulan Andresen from the University of Oslo, and uh, from the. Uh, I'll have it up in front of me, the Nordic, I guess it's the Norwegian Center for Mental Health. And uh, the, Alex will give the first presentation. And um, while he's talking, uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and think about these questions. And um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alex and I'm a researcher at the Norwegian Center for Mental Disorders Research in University of Oslo. Uh, so I will give a presentation about mathematical models and how can they help us to understand the genetic architecture of brain disorders. Could you please tell me if you can see my screen sharing? It's supposed to keep up now. Yes, go ahead. Perfect. So uh, let's 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 start. I, I will I will give a brief overview of the of this presentation on this slide. So we will have five parts going from the from the left side, uh, starting with uh, an overview of the big data collected by imaging and genetics, and that's uh, what we what is fueling our data analysis and after our development of these models. Then in the second and third part, we will talk about the genetic architecture of brain disorders and the brain-related phenotypes. I will here explain the concept of the polygenic overlap as shown here on this Venn diagram in the part number two. So the gray area representing the overlapping genetic architecture between two phenotypes. And then we will extend this from two phenotypes to many, many phenotypes, uh, which is especially important for the neuroimaging. And we will talk about the multivariate association in GWAS. Then uh, I will move to part number four, where we'll summarize the mathematical modeling concepts that we use here, particularly mixture direction, mixed, uh, mixed distribution, mixed direction, mixture distributions, and multivariate GWAS. So you will hear these terms from me a couple of times, and uh, yeah, I will summarize them in the mathematical modeling part. And then we will very briefly discuss the tools that we built using these concepts. And I will uh, wrap up and then Ulla can speak about the enabling prediction and precision medicine in brain disorders. So this is how we will leverage these concepts to move the field forward. So uh, let's get started. Uh, speaking of the data sets, uh, uh, and this is just to name a few, of course, there is a massive sequencing data collected, a decode and ongoing effort in sequencing UK Biobank with whole exome sequencing data already in place from UK Biobank. And uh, I think UK estimate, UK Biobank estimated almost like five petabytes of data in sequencing uh, that is coming soon. So this is, we are talking about really some very big data here. And uh, data like HRC, Haplotype Reference Consortia that uh, everyone can access upon application, the upcoming uh, 1 million genomes project. Uh, this is a massive amount of sequencing data. 
for this presentation, I would rather focus on common variants, uh, and because we mainly use the data from like GWAS from international consortia, including psychiatric genomic consortia or uh, MVP, the Million Veterans Program, and even even some data from from the commercial providers like 23andMe sharing self-declared uh, bipolar GWAS or. or um, really, really large samples uh, exceeding now uh, 1 million, sometimes 2 million participants and uh, still uh, very much shareable because there is no long in GWAS, the re net result is a summary statistics. So this is something people can share and we can use that for building these mathematical models, uh, download this data and analyze it. So joining it with the reference data, let's say from HRC, this gives a very, very powerful setting to study the genetic architecture of brain disorders. Um, so, uh, and in addition to the case control design or the single phenotype GWAS, uh, now there is an abundance of neuroimaging data uh, from Enigma Consortia or UK Biobank, uh, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. Like UK Biobank alone is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the largest single cohort of neuroimaging data with currently 43,000 individuals with different data modalities, including functional MRI and resting state and also the structural brain MRI. So uh, this is a data that uh, I would use as an example of multi-phenotype data, because from neuroimaging we can derive, let's say, using tools like FreeSurfer and different parcellations of human cortex of the cerebral cortex, we can extract the, let's say, volumetric information on different uh, regions of the brain, like on this figure on the right, it's shown a desiccant Kiliani parcellation of the brain with 34 uh, areas for each hemisphere. And uh, then it's, uh, we know that these structures are heritable and it's important to further study their genetic architecture, but uh, there are limitations of current methods that if we use a, G was on each of these traits in isolation, then we have a severe reduction in power. So I will I will talk a bit more about this multi-phenotype data, both derived from neuroimaging, but they can also be like questionnaires from ABCD study or UK Biobank on different mental traits, or the, the mob I mentioned here is a Norwegian mother, father, and child, also very deeply phenotyped, multi-phenotype samples that we can use for these multivariate methods. Um, so um, to move to the second part about the genetic architecture, I will start with the power curves. So the, the curves here highlight uh, our best estimate, uh, our estimates of what sample size would we need in the GWAS study to reach, to explain certain fraction of the heritability from the loss I discovered in GWAS. And for example, the first two curves you see on the left, the one in pink and blue, is the curves corresponding to height, that's the first curve, and schizophrenia, that's the second one. And despite a fairly similar heritability, there is a vastly different sample size needed to reach 50% uh, of variants explained. Uh, so, uh, and uh, to understand why this is the case, we need to go beyond heritability and look into the more detailed effect size distribution of the genetic effects in these traits. Uh, what we uh, what we understood looking at the data is that uh, height has a much lower polygenicity than schizophrenia by factors three times, and therefore the genetic effects in schizophrenia are distributed into a, a more loci. So of course each loci therefore on average have a lower effect, and we need a larger sample size to discover this. So modeling uh, in more detail this mixture distribution with a fraction of causal variants and another fraction of non-causal variants is something that is quite important because many of the current methods use infinitesimal models that doesn't address this. So to, to account for SNPs not created equal, it's quite important uh, for, for both our understanding of future GWAS and also for the accuracy of the polygenic predictors that we, that we build using these models. Um, so now, now that we understand that the traits have different polygenicity, we can also start moving into the cross-trait analysis and look at shared loci uh, associated with multiple traits. So here, here we show an example of the cross-trait analysis between uh, schizophrenia and body mass index, a trait that essentially show a very low genetic correlation. But nevertheless, we could discover the loci associated with both traits. The easiest way to understand this would be to go to a GWAS and look for an overlapping loci. 
take the results, summary statistics from two GWAS, and try to see whether the loci overlaps. Here we use a technique called conjunctional false discovery rate based on empirical bias to further boost the statistical power of this analysis. But, uh, uh, the, and, and we do discover tens of loci that are shared between these two hits despite very low correlation. So this, uh, this tool, this technique has a capability to highlight specific genes and that would help us to understand the biological mechanisms, shared mechanism between these disorders. Uh, but of course, there, are, there could be confounding factors that drive the association in two loci. Let's say we do expect that in MHC region, many traits would show an association because of a complex LD structure. So to take this into account and move a bit deeper into the genetic architecture of these traits, we developed the mixer tool to further investigate polygenic overlap. Uh, so with this analysis, we deeply take into account the LD structure and at the level of causal additive genetic effects, we, we try to see how many of the variants are overlapping. So, uh, and uh, not surprisingly, we, we find a highly overlapping genetic architecture between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. This is known cross-trait relationship uh, with high correlation of 0.7 or 70% genetic correlation. However, for some other cross-trait relationships, let's say between schizophrenia and education attainment, we, we see that uh, despite there is no correlation, still our model estimates that there is a lot of shared genetic variance between these traits. Uh, so, to, to, to give you an illustrative example, how, how like, what, what this, uh, what this mean, uh, let's look at this toy, toy example. For example, here, uh, we show four examples of the cross-trait genetic relationships. The, the first one shows a very high genetic, uh, show each trait here has three causal variants highlighted in the red dots. And in the first example, the scenario A, both of the shared variants have a consistent effect direction. Therefore, we end up with positive genetic correlation and the polygenic overlap. You can also imagine that, let's say, ADHD and educational attainment have a negative genetic correlation, and there could be that our two shared variants drive the risk in one disorder but protect from another. This is an opposite genetic correlation. Scenario C is no polygenic overlap. No causal variants are shared between traits. And the last example is what we are aiming to capture with Mixer is if there is a, a shared set of SNPs affecting the risk in two traits, or, but uh, the effect direction is inconsistent. Right? This is an example of the polygenic overlap where, effect, where different uh, low side drive the risk in, in different directions, and therefore the overall uh, correlation is canceled out. In reality, it would look more like this. It's not two or three, it's really hundreds of thousands of genetic variants. So this last example of the polygenic overlap result correlation, if you plot z-scores in one trait versus z-score in the other trait, it would rather look like uh, a very blurry picture, especially complicated due to uh, the linkage disequilibrium structure. So all of the vertical spikes you see on Manhattan plot would result in a pretty noisy picture when we plot this in the cross-trait analysis. And uh, we need to go deep into the modeling of LD structure to kind of understand what is going on in the law side and uh, attempt, to, uh, see, attempt to infer with, uh, with uh, max likelihood methods whether these two traits actually share cause of law side or it's, it's only, only the correlation induced by linkage equilibrium. So this method works with summary statistics and reference panel from an external LD trying to model the effects of linkage equilibrium and modeling the underlying genetic architecture. Um, now, extending this, extending this beyond two traits, we can go into multivariate analysis, which is especially relevant for, for the neuroimaging measures. What we show here on this slide is an example of a specific, of the distributed effects of a given SNP. I believe it's a SNP on chromosome 15. Is this RS number put here? And this SNP has a substantial association with uh, the cortical area in many, many different parts of the brain. So it's important to use this information because uh, when we do the loci discovery for neuroimaging measures, 
because otherwise, in addition to one million effective dimension of the one million correction for for the large number of independent SNPs in the genome, we need to take a further hit and do the Bonferroni correction for the number of phenotypes involved here. But with multivariate associations, we can rather benefit from this additional information we have uh, from multiple brain regions. Combine them in a single statistical test, what we call the multivariate omnibus statistical test, and uh, then uh, building on this tool, do the screening of the genetic variants to find those that uh, are associated with brain phenotypes. And as a secondary analysis, look which traits are associated, which of the brain regions are associated. And now, because of this technique, we, 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 with this technique, we rather benefit from having many traits, multiple measures. We can, instead, instead of uh, using just a handful of ROIs derived from the neuroimaging measures, we can actually look at the more granular uh, uh, neuroimaging structures like vertex-wise data and uh, further boost the statistical power, including thousands of regions into this analysis. So the, the three plots shown here, the, the bottom one shows a mean P analysis with standard methods where we basically analyze every ROI independently and then correct for the multiple testing. The middle one is R, so ROI is region of interest. It's in this particular analysis, 34 uh, measures per hemisphere with basic and Kiliani atlas. And uh, using them in most test analysis, we boost the power by a factor of three, and then yet another factor of three if we don't aggregate brain measures into ROIs but go for vertex wise data. So, uh, this is a powerful technique that boosts the statistical power to detect associations um, using the, in the, when we do the G, multivariate GWAS in the imaging measures. And of course, it's possible to put all of this together, right? The three concepts that I mentioned, the mixed distributions, the fact that there is a mixture of causal and non-causal variants, causal shown in red here, and the white dots, non-causal variants, a mixture direction that there is no consistency of effect direction across genetic variants. They, they all sort of drag the risk in a different direction, but it's a core subset of SNPs that is driving the risk in multiple phenotypes. And with multivariate modeling, we need to include tens, if not hundreds of these phenotypes in a single model to, to really better understand the, the genetics of the brain and brain, brain disorders and brain-related phenotypes. So we believe that the, this picture is uh, quite special for the brain because in somatic traits, uh, they would be more individual, but in the brain, there is this you know, very large complexity that needs to, that require all of this different aspects of the architecture to be treated in a unified model. So, and to summarize limitations, some of the limitations of current methods, it's the infinitesimal model introduced uh, basically a century ago for twin studies, allowing to capture heritability and genetic correlations. But now with access to more in genotyping or sequencing data, we could make more granular, study more granular genetic architectures. Uh, and the omnigenic hypothesis uh, with core genes influencing phenotypes. Uh, but uh, for brain disorders, probably there is more than just a handful of core genes. It's likely that hundreds or maybe even thousands of genes directly influence brain phenotypes. And finally, the mass univariate GWAS could be uh, uh, too simplistic, and we can gain power by using the multivariate analysis, like in the neuroimaging, as I showed before. Finally, one minute on this. Uh, we have these tools, they're available on GitHub, they're on the open source license. So you're very welcome to give it a try and let us know about the feedback or, yeah. Um, I think this is this is all I had and we can move to the discussion or to the oldest presentation. Thank you so much. Um, our next presenter will be Ole Andreasen and uh, if you stop your share there, Alex, uh, consider these questions while you're um, hearing Ulla's uh, uh, presentation. And Ulla, are you ready to go now? Yes, thanks. So you can see my presentation also. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, have uh, some discussions about uh, psychiatry and mental illness. Uh, at this webinar series, and I will talk uh, 
today about how we can exploit all the multiple small genetic effects that uh, uh, Alexander discussed uh, in developing uh, precision psychiatry tools. And uh, I'm Ole Andreas and I'm the director of the Norman Center, a large um, multidisciplinary research um, center in uh, Oslo, Norway. And the background, uh, I will talk a bit about the background and then give some examples of how we can uh, uh, see uh, in the future of precision medicine in psychiatry. So as we heard that uh, psychiatric disorders are highly heritable uh, and they have a complex heritability and also we you know there is a input or effect of environmental factors so it's quite complex but then you know the increase in uh, in technology development has really made uh, DNA genotyping so inexpensive these days so it will change the healthcare you know it's cheaper than parking at the hospital people say and uh, it has already changed psychiatric genetics uh, and you can see that there are uh, i will show you know a lot of example of these uh, the polygenic architecture and uh, even though there are also a few rare variants discovered i'm going to also stick to the common variants these will small effects and you can see here are just some examples um, Schizophrenia on Medarchime now, the most recent uh, from the PGC, I think there are like 270 loci discovered. A lot of small effects, uh, bipolar disorder the same uh, on Medarchime now, uh, more than 60 loci and more are in the pipeline. And then also Alzheimer's disease, uh, where you have the strong hit on chromosome 19, the APOE, but in addition, we have a lot of small effects starting to emerge when you get these large sample sizes. So not only disorders, also brain-related traits like cognition. I think there are now over 200 variants associated with uh, intelligence. And also a, a more broader, uh, what I call a phenotype, like educational attainment, is highly polygenic. Of course, there are many mechanisms or many ways for, for affecting one's education, but still it shows how these common small effects are associated with uh, very critical human uh, uh, brain related disorders and traits. So it's uh, really a lot, the common uh, or polygenic architecture is the name of the game now, the new normal. And uh, interesting title here, we, we polygenicity in psychiatry, uh, you know, like it or not, we have to understand it. So I think this from Gandal and Geshwin just a few months ago. And what I am focusing on in this presentation is, uh, can we make all the new discoveries in psychiatric genetics uh, into clinical relevant use? You know, I, I work in the clinic, uh, I, I see patients and I have many colleagues. And even though that we have a lot of nature and science papers, a lot of excitement in the field, we need to bring it to, into the healthcare. And that is what I will, uh, will focus the rest of my presentation on to give you some cases on how this can be obtained but there is a lot of push now for precision medicine this uh, paper just came out uh, uh, it will transform healthcare mostly driven by genes uh, this is written by the head of the nih in the us uh, and uh, it's um, uh, happy to say that uh, this a lot of the ideas they presented in the US was uh, first uh, presented here in uh, the Nordic uh, Society's uh, paper about uh, how we can uh, develop the precision medicine initiatives in the Nordic region and how fruitful that can be. 
then uh, from the Collins paper, what they sort of highlighted was several of, of the drivers. One thing is genomics, but it has to be integrated with big data, as we heard from uh, Alex, and then uh, electronic health records, uh, genomics or self reports. And these are all uh, really uh, important elements of the Nordic approach. And also we have a lot of uh, trust in the governments and also we have these uh, longitudinal cohorts. So this is really uh, a strong argument for developing uh, precision medicine initiatives in the Nordic regions, but also uh, Collins didn't mention anything about psychiatry. All of these elements are, if anything, they're very relevant to psychiatric field. So that's why I'm going to talk here now about precision psychiatry, where we have highly heritable uh, uh, diseases. You have a uh, need of longitudinal cohorts, uh, easy to do self-reporting and so a lot of these elements fits uh, the precision psychiatry, and which is precision medicine and psychiatry. So for, for what is uh, what are we talking about? One is prediction. Uh, where can we predict a disease uh, appearing? Then stratification. Can we find the right treatment for the individual patient? And. Uh, Currently, there are some, uh, the standard in the field is this polygenic risk score. And you see it's on the nacle Kirky R squared is, is a way of, of calculating the explained variance. It's getting pretty high now. This is the, the, the most the published paper from 2014. It's, it's increasing even more now in the 2028 paper. But can it be used as a diagnostic tools? But, but the, and here you, here you can see the odds ratio uh, on the y-axis and x-axis, the size of uh, risk, and it's in, in the 10th percentile, there seems to be quite high odds ratios. This is for uh, Danish and Swedish data, but still it is not yet uh, uh, good enough for clinical utility because it's... Uh, you know, in the real world sampling, uh, it, it will be different. And then also the, the positive predictive value is too low here. There's too much overlap between cases and controls. And another aspect that is not that uh, sort of uh, discussed is the overlap. You know, the, this is an interesting study from uh, the Nordic uh, samples. This is from, uh, from uh, Iceland where they use polygenic risk scores from schizophrenia and bipolar and see that they could predict crea creative um, traits in the population. And this fits with the non-overlap with uh, between like bipolar disorder and the uh, artistic temperament or, or artistic professions. So there are several ethical issues also in the prediction in the psychiatry that you need to be careful if there's a lot of overlapping traits. Then uh, uh, Alex talked about machine learning and these big data tools. And I'm, uh, you know, every other day you can read about these new fancy tools, computers uh, beat even the Norwegian uh, chess champion Magnus Carlsen. Uh, but in chess, you know the rules in advance, and it's very easy to get all kinds of training samples. The problem in mental illness, and the reason why I don't think I have wasted uh, my education uh, being a psychiatrist because, like, a computer will take over. No, the needs machine learning tools needs uh, supervision by biology and, and clinical knowledge, at least today. And we also need large samples. And there we have all the GDPR problems uh, and informed consent that uh, um, the Google guys uh, are not, you know, or chess, we don't need those aspects. That is what is needed in psychiatric genetics. And it's very important to keep this in mind. 
then where if we move on where, for for examples so i think what we can start with in psychiatry as a use case is uh, stratification if we can find better ways of applying our psychopharmacological agents because the problem is that most drug companies they have left the field it's not many brainy ideas in pharma as you can see from this uh, news focus so we need to improve current treatment and that can be done like an example here with antipsychotics that's used for treating severe mental illness like schizophrenia or psychosis and today it's a lot of trial and error they have severe side effects and they're like 30 percent without much response but it's hard to tell that and then people can go for like a couple of years before we say oh it it's we, we, it didn't work well so would be great clinical uh, use if you could identify patients who will respond before we start treatment. And there are, if we can use these uh, models uh, and genetics to predict treatment response, and then um, we can use some biology information to improve the prediction tools. And this is an approach based on protein-protein uh, interactions, um, that there's a, like a network biology. We know the antipsychotic drug targets. And we have now, we're increasingly being uh, aware of the schizophrenia risk genes. And maybe we could build some kind of predictors based on that knowledge in combination. And, so this is a way to stratify treatment. And, and we just done some very preliminary analysis here. Uh, um, this is a protein-protein network approach where we took the schizophrenia risk genes and then looked at the drug target interactome for neighbors. And you can see here, uh, there's a lot of uh, strong networks being built by connecting these um, the psychotic drug response uh, proteins. And then we've been involved in developing a kind of selection method to, to collect those SNPs associated with these networks. And in a very preliminary data, we did the training. Uh, we just chose 90% for tra training and 10% uh, to, to test. And we took um, a response group consisting of um, normal antipsychotic treated, which is a proxy for response, and then clozapine, which is a drug that is only uh, prescribed for people without any effect on pr two previous antipsychotic trials. And uh, selected like 30,000 SNPs and then did control for, for um, age and some principal components. And then we got a pretty good area under the curve in this uh, ROC curve. So here we can, if this, of course, we need to replicate and test it out the bigger samples and, uh, uh, and independent samples, but here we have a specificity and sensitivity that could be of clinical relevance only based on common variants of schizophrenia. What about the uh, prediction? So a good example there is Alzheimer's disease, um, or now it's called in the newest uh, psychiatric diagnostic tool is called major cognitive disorder. Uh, so that, uh, we, we would like to identify people who develop Alzheimer's disease um, because it would be good to start intervention before they develop the disorder. And uh, it has been known for many years that APOE is a risk factor, this big peak on chromosome 19. Then here we can also use supervised machine learning, but in this example, we just use a standard uh, polygenic hazard score because the point with Alzheimer's disease is highly age dependent. So we, we sort of designed the model. So with this uh, 
when you develop the disease, not if. So, so we didn't use a case control, but we used an age of onset because we said that uh, everyone will develop Alzheimer's disease if they live long enough. The goal is to predict when it starts. Then we could build this survival model here at age 60. Nobody has a disease. This is based on the big ADC data, by the way. And then you can follow them. Uh, this is average here and here a hundred years, most have developed uh, Alzheimer's. And then they put them in bins. This is the uh, lowest risk, the blue. You can see the line when they develop the disease and, and the red is age of onset for those with the highest risk. And like the 50%, there's a large variation from like 75 years to 95 years of, uh, of, of age of onset. And that is quite significant. And then um, based on this model, you can look for the density uh, of, of, of age of onset, probability density. You can see the peak here with the highest risk that's around 80 years, and then it goes on with increasing age. And based on this, you can then estimate individual or, or, or incidence. So here we know the population incidence proportion. This is based on the United States, but we have much stronger, we're working on that now, much better prevalence estimates in, in Scandinavian or the Nordic countries. So here can I go and say, okay, if you're eight years, the population baseline is 1.44, then the the least uh, genetic susceptibility, they have only 0.3%, but if you go to the highest, it's 10.5% of risk for developing the disease when you're 80 years old. And this is far beyond the standard uh, prediction estimates from uh, the APOE data. And as uh, Alex talked about uh, on the more the mathematical uh, point, the, what can you use these sort of uh, mathematical tools from or the multimodal approaches for in stratification? And here is a very good clinical use case. It's a memory clinic. And definitely there you both want to start the treatment before uh, neurodegenerations uh, of Alzheimer's disease starts. And that was, I think th there was a lot of uh, failed big clinical trials the uh, last five years in Alzheimer's disease. And many say that they failed. It was billion dollar programs. They failed because they started the treatment too late. Because if you wait for the symptoms to appear, the Degeneration has been uh, already too severe, so the cells are damaged, and then there is no drug that will work. And in a clinical setting, you want to figure out also who can be selected for intervention. And here we use the more supervised machine learning approach, uh, building on also the big data kind of imaging, because um, that is a, a a big yeah, sort of or, or clinical now implemented protocol in, in uh, most countries. So we can uh, then estimate the, the risk if you have um, a memory complaint, come to the doctor and we can then build and understand who will develop and how fast you will develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. And again, here you can see. Uh, it's a five-year sample. This is also, unfortunately, from the U.S. We need more of these Nordic samples, I think. So this is uh, uh, arriving at the memory clinic with a memory complaint, and then nobody developed Alzheimer's here, and he, down here, you developed Alzheimer's disease. And you can see after five years, just um, stratifying by the polygenic hazard score, the odds ratio between 20 
it up an eighty miss like three point six, and you can see there's a uh, large variety in in the risk of developing or the probability of developing Alzheimer's disease. This is only the photogenic hazard that we already showed, but then what if you also do the uh, clinical brain imaging? Well, then you get an even better stratification. So uh, these on the top here are very uh, unlikely to develop, develop disease, but here it's much higher and the odds ratio is now 13. And then we're getting into clinical relevant uh, uh, sort of setting. But then it's also in a memory clinic, you test cognitive domains. And here we added the third modality uh, being a verbal learning test. And then you can see re really that there are some people here that are coming to the clinic. You can tell them this is highly unlikely that you will develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. All the, these three groups are, are like very small likelihood. In these others where you have a higher risk, there you have a much more likely um, to develop Alzheimer's disease. And here we have a ratio of over 25. So this is really into the clinical uh, prediction level with, that we can use. So I will conclude there. Um, so what we today focus on the common variants. Uh, there are some uh, use cases uh, in to develop precision psychiatry, even now when we using the discoveries and the tools we have for clinical relevant stratification. Prediction is uh, maybe a bit more into the future. Uh, and there, like here, I said here, we there are some ethical issues and, and we have been engaged in including user groups and starting to line out um, how this can be done. I think also we need multimodal approaches. Most of the signal, if you have a high heritability, yeah, it's driven by genetics, but by including other factors, you can even make it more uh, clinically relevant. But then we definitely need the Nordics infrastructure for uh, developing these large uh, training and test samples. And I illustrated this on the right hand here. So mental illness, if I think we have a beautiful opportunity in the Nordic cohorts. We have the registries and biobank and lifespan information from a lot of people already now. I think there are over 2 million uh, available. We have an uh, opportunity to do uh, phenotyping, clinical brain imaging, self-rating of symptoms, and then adding that to data and novel analytical tools. We can use the common variants to develop these prediction and stratification tools and then ongoing we'll get and i didn't talk about that today uh discovering a rare variance where we can uh, fine-tune more the biology to develop the disease mechanisms and maybe better drugs so this i just want to thank uh, all the study participants in these studies there's uh, hundred thousands of participants who are engaged in research that's very important we have extensive uh, collaboration with um, nordic partners and international uh, studies and uh, we have a very productive team at our center so thanks to all thank you Thank you, uh, Alex and Ulle. And uh, we have a, an unusually shy audience. There are 72 people watching, uh, but no questions submitted yet. And I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just put up the uh, slides that uh, the questions that Ulle and Alex have prepared ahead of time that they uh, wanted to address, maybe in case any of the audience members would like to make a comment. But uh, I think I, maybe what I will do is uh, 
I will ask Kauri if uh, he would be willing to um, step in uh, and provide an initial comment on the, uh, while we see if there are some more questions coming in. Would that be okay, Kauri? Yeah, that is all right. But the, uh, Will you, can you, Nate, how come? Will you leave these questions for the faces doesn't do anything? Sure. Right? I, I, um, I can put the questions back up. The, uh... It is best to avoid these ugly faces. And <laughs> <at> this <time. laughs> so, so the question is why the genetics of brain function different from other organs? There are all kinds of reasons that uh, it is difficult to study the genetics of, or of uh, brain function. First of all, we have substantial difficulties defining the function of the brain. I mean, the most important ones are, you know, the generation of thoughts and emotions, and we cannot even define them. And how are you going to go about studying the genetics or functions that you cannot even define? In addition to that, if, if, if it is correct what the literature says, that half of the genes in the genome are only expressed in the brain, it is bound to be a fairly complex task, oftentimes, to uh, piece together the, the genetics of, of, uh, of these functions of the, of the brain, which is, you know, when it comes to the brain diseases, we are most often just we are most often calling, you know, abnormal function, aberration in the, in the physiological function, we call them diseases, right? There's just one, there's just one little thing that uh, irritated me, Ule, and, and I want you to explain to me. You said that most of these big clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease had failed because the treatment was started too late. Please show me the data or point me to the data that show that this conclusion of yours is correct. Uh, I think I don't think there is evidence uh, like uh, real trial uh, evidence or some statistical proof. It's it's more like uh, uh, the, several people in the field I think have said that uh, uh, it's not their drugs that failed. It is because they started too late. So. I, I'm just referring to some of the expertise in the field. I, of course, it could also be that the drug failed, but I think um, this this I like this I like much better because there is absolutely no evidence in existence that it is because the trial was started too late, the treatment was started too late. It is an assumption that is not illogical, but it is just an assumption. Yeah, yeah. And when, you're, when you're lecturing us on a uh, the genetics of diseases, we expect you to have at least tiny little bit of evidence to support your conclusions, a little bit, all right? That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> so, no, but I, I, I think there were, um, I remember I was at the Alzheimer's meeting five years ago and they were all excited that they had like four or five candidates and all of them ended up uh, as a failed trials. And I think uh, some of the, the drug companies, their stock prices went down like 10% because of these uh, failures. So I think this has been an enormous amount of investments in... Yeah, in okay. uh, I, can, I can give you another, uh, another assumption that some of us have made looking at the failure of these trials, and that is that the mechanism of the onset of disease is different from the mechanism of progression. So these drugs, you know, that's the assumption is that the deposition of amyloid is the initiating event in Alzheimer's disease, all right? And these drugs that failed turned out to be very effective in decreasing deposition of amyloid. They even led to dis dissolution of amyloid plaques, but the cognitive decline continued. So one of the, one of the hypotheses that you can put forward is that the progression of the disease is due to tau pathology. The initiating event is the deposition of amyloid. And in that way, it is similar to the chronic, 
traumatic injury or brain, which is multiple blows to the head, can lead to a um, uh, demanding disorder or, dis or, or, or cognitive decline. And the cognitive decline continues even if the blow to the head stops. So you can look at the amyloid plaque as the equivalence of the blows to the head. But, but I, think it is, I think it is not an unreasonable assumption that it would have led to better results to start the trials earlier. But that is not trivial, and that will not be solved by, by genetic risk models, because before you see clinical uh, cognitive decline, you're probably a couple of decades uh, from the start of the biochemical process that may actually be irreversible. I'm going to jump in with a question now since we have one posted. Uh, this is for Alex uh, from Miles Axton. How is age-dependent structural change handled in the multivariate analysis of genetics of neural imaging? Now, this is a great question. So basically in multivariate analysis, we did similar to the univariate analysis where uh, we included ages covariate for every brain structure we've analyzed. Uh, and uh, uh, what's quite interesting is that we further, like there is some preliminary data where we looked for implication analysis between the multivariate loss that we discovered in UKB and we look how well they replicate in ABCD. Right, so we're looking at a very big difference in age groups between like 40 to 50 year old versus uh, children in ABCD study. And still they replicate at a quite, quite good rate, uh, 60 to 80%. So um, it's, um, it's definitely something we can look further into building the, as, as in PHS, like the model Uwe presented uh, about the age dependent modeling. Uh, we can go into that direction, but right now we're more like covering out for the age and looking for the variants that are age independent. I uh, hope that answered it. Thanks. Uh, um, Miles has a follow up question, also one for Ulle. Uh, he says, uh, Are age and educational attainment the only environmental factors relevant? You have self reporting, but will this yield the immediate experience of the personal environment? necessary to understand uh, gene by environment of cognitive impairment? That's, that's a great question. So I think um, uh, cognitive uh, phenotypes are more stable. So what we think will be of value is self-reports of, uh, of mood or co uh, thoughts and like emotions. And I think that is uh, uh, where you need these longitudinal cohorts. If you can sort of get some kind of uh, large scale uh, data from people when you're sleeping less or having more anxiety or, or getting down more into depression and then see what kind of uh, genetic susceptibility and that could maybe be a, a, a way to to estimate the, the kind of the risk for developing a new episode that is for example for bipolar disorder that is typically about um, episodes over the lifespan but also for for example uh, depression if, if uh, there is uh, less heritability uh, for depression. And I think um, there it could be even more uh, sort of informative to develop or have uh, some kind of tools that can uh, combine the genetic risk with um, external uh, environmental stressors. And I think, uh, the good thing uh, in many ways for, for psychiatry in this uh, kind of new precision medicine world is that a lot of the stressors are based on your own uh, thoughts or how you evaluate them. If you really feel that this was bad and this was uh, really upsetting me and I can't go and sleep, then it's your impression that defines the sort of impact. It's not some kind of 
psychiatrist telling you what is important or not. So I think that's why I think there's a particular interest or, or relevance for these uh, uh, precision medicine, a kind of uh, big data collection in, um, in, in mental illness. Ole, how, how do you come to the conclusion that cognitive phenotypes are particularly stable? Right? They are. I mean, they, no. they, they are one of the things that uh, change dramatically with age. Right. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but between, uh, sorry, yeah, between, uh, I think it's it's you're pretty stable from early adulthood to uh, to to age decline. But it's what, very interesting this because in in depression, cognitive problems, memory, uh, concentration errors, that is part of the the diagnostic criteria. So it is not stable. So, so I agree that you know, with, uh, but in general, in the population, it, I think it's pretty stable, isn't it? Why did you then say that cognitive phenotype is particularly stable? I'm trying to figure out where you're coming coming from. You must... Uh, no, no I, 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 I'm thinking that there are, uh, from the neuropsychology field, you know, we, we talk about, so I, I'm coming from like severe mental illness, they say, in 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 uh, uh, like schizophrenia and in uh, severe mood episodes, they are coming and going. Much more variation, but compared to the cognitive uh, uh, status, which is more stable. And I think you know, compared to those uh, kind of uh, different uh, domains, I think uh, cognition is still uh, stable, more stable than other symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, like to bring in some of the other panelists and I'll uh, try to do this in uh, alphabetical order. Last name, uh, Sarah Bergen uh, uh, from Karolinska Institute. And uh, Sarah, do you have comments, questions for Ulla and Alex? First, I'd like to thank both Alexander and Ulla for really interesting talks. First, for a wonderful overview of a lot of the modern methods being used to understand the genetics of uh, mostly psychiatric disorders. And then for what we know about the genetics of these disorders so far and how they can be used in um, stratification and prediction. Um, one of the themes uh, that's been running through this, this um, webinar is multimodality in the analyses and discussed a few of the other different types of um, information that could be used um, beyond like polygenic risk scores, such as protein-protein uh, interaction networks and neuroimaging data. But I'm wondering what other types of information we might want to incorporate. There was also some mention Olda, just recently about the exposome. Um, the environmental measures that, that people experience that um, might be worth incorporating into uh, prediction or stratification uh, algorithms. And that could be done either through what people have directly experienced or possibly through epigenetic data. Um, we've also mentioned how sequencing data could be used, but not in a very um, direct way for how that could be applied. Um, and possible we could leverage our newfound information about all of the relationships with comorbid conditions and the, the genetic sharing with other disorders. So perhaps um, polygenic risk for different uh, related disorders could be incorporated into these models. So what what are your thoughts about other types of data modalities that might be incorporated? Maybe I can start. So I, I think it's good to focus on the brain. And unfortunately, that is where we have uh, the biggest difficulties in obtaining direct uh, sort of tissue samples. And so we are sort of scrambling or, or trying to sort of 
obtain external information about what is going on in the brain. Uh, that is, um, uh, and, and if we want to do big discoveries, I think there is something with pricing and something with, um, you know, practicalities. So that is why I think brain imaging with uh, the kind of structural variation only is what we have biggest data from, but then there's also uh, DTI, this uh, white tracts that this, uh, that could maybe be more closer to the uh, kind of functional aspects, but it is, uh, uh, it is, uh, I, I, what would you say? I think it's difficult to know this in advance where we will find the answer, but I, it is unfortunately in a way that we are uh, limited by the what is available. And uh, I think what is so interesting is like with UK Biobank now, they have 100,000 brain scans. So, or they will have it when the COVID-19 is over. So that's why I think that is so, uh, so important. But there are also, I know, like proteomics and big uh, screening, like metabolomics uh, possibilities and, and how this can best be implemented in uh, understanding brain diseases. That is, uh, uh, it's, I think there's uh, lots of opportunities, but it's hard to, to, uh, to uh, we just need to collect the data, I think, and coordinate and collaborate on how to do this. Uh, Danya Gubgatsen, uh, you're the next person up if you have a comment or a question. I just have one question for Alexander. I'm wondering, so when you're looking at uh, the correlation between uh, the overlap, genetic overlap between traits. So when you're doing genetic correlation, you use the effect sizes to calculate the correlation. But when you're using the overlap, uh, how do you account for basically the genome, the differences in the genome? If you have a variant associating with a disease, it's much more likely to be of biological relevance. So how do you account for like just... Uh, or kind of correct for just kind of general variants being more likely to be have a biological consequence uh, versus them having some actual relevance. Uh, this is a great question. So uh, actually, it is, is a difference in the functional enrichment across variants and also in the gene, gene level enrichments like. Uh, pathways uh, or gene sets. It's something that I work on right now as the next version of this model. And in terms of the polygenic overlap that I presented, we basically run simulations uh, simulating the genetic architecture where there is an enrichment either in like regions concerned in mammals or the five prime UTRs, exonic regions. And we saw that, yes, of course, this has an effect on the polygenic overlap, but like we don't uh, change the conclusions from, from our polygenic overlap analysis due to the fact that we didn't explicitly model for those regions. So um, it's something that we could more actively model in the near future, but right, right now it's more like we've addressed that this effect is probably not changing our conclusion and the polygenic overlap is still beyond the, this enrichment that you mentioned. You, you simply hope it is not going to change it. Uh, yes, plus we run some simulations. So, of course, this is uh, this depends on every phenotype that we analyze. But um, it, it looks like there is a more shared uh, overlap than what would be explained by the shared enrichments in different regions of genes. Thanks, I'm uh, Alexander, if, if you could mute uh, yours. Now I'm gonna move on to Arno Palotti from FEM. Uh, Arno, are you with us still? Here I am, I'm still with us. So <laughs> thank you. Actually, uh, thank you uh, Ola and, and both of you for, for interesting presentations. Uh, Ola, you, you are seeing patients and, and you have a clinical um, 
everyday touch to, uh, to, to what's, uh, what's usable and what can be used in, in the clinic. If I understood correctly, you, you, you thought already that now with, with a polygenic uh, architecture, uh, you think that there would be utilities um, to use them in a clinical setting. It remains somewhat unclear to me. Could you, could you elaborate on that one, that, that how, how, how can those results be used? I understand in research, but, but in a clinical setting. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, I think we, my, my push for this, or my like opinion was that we should maybe try with what we have already in the research field to see if we can push it into clinical relevance more. And what I think could be the most uh, sort of low hanging fruit there is in uh, uh, pharmacology, psychopharmacology, because we're, if we can have, we don't need a perfect uh, prediction that this patient will respond or not, but if you can do genetic test, do some, uh, uh, assessment in advance and say, okay, this is like 60% uh, uh, likely to respond and this uh, here person here is like 30%. You don't need uh, like perfect, uh, what do you say, prediction rates because there's no, there's nothing. There's totally nothing to build on and we are sort of first testing one drug and People have a lot of, of problems, a lot of, uh, you know, nothing works. And is it because the dose is too low or is it, let's see, we, we, you know, we increase the dose and they get even more side effects maybe. And we sort of, and then they have to be admitted to hospital again. And then, so there's a long, uh, what do you say, trial and error phase. So I think if we can have some estimates based on genetics of, of some, uh, uh, side effects of drugs or response to drugs. I think that could be um, uh, the initial phase. And, and there we could also build on some of the, the rare variants. You know, there are these uh, 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 liver and some cytochrome mm -hmm. uh, system that uh, uh, are affecting the serum levels. And, and, this I know there. Are, this is already implemented in some um, some uh, treatment healthcare systems, like a screening. But it's there's not yet uh, like a systematic uh, efforts to build on this to implement it. So I think that is where we could. Uh, that's the most uh, sort of likely use case I think in psychiatry. Oh, Arnold, I, Arnold, I have a, a different answer to this question that. Mm -hmm. Psychiatry is in many ways a field that has been struggling for quite some time and, and a lot of the diagnosis has been based on, on behavior. But this has been behavior of diagnosis. You don't have biomarkers. But now we have many examples of particularly rare structural variants that are very pleiotrophic. They increase the risk of schizophrenia, autism, ADSD, <laughs> and even epilepsy. <laughs> Perhaps we should be uh, prescribing medicine on the basis of their genetic alterations rather than the clinical phenotype, because that you know what we want to do is to is to correct biochemical pathways that are perturbed by the disease, and and the perturbation may to lead to all kinds of, of clinical phenotype depending on in what cell in you know. It, when, when during development, mutation took place and, and stuff like that. So I think, I think that the utility there could be, you know, the early utility in this case is a rare mutation may be much greater than it when it comes exactly. to... The, you were in a way continuing my... Oh, sorry, Gary, go ahead. Because the polygenic approach is sort of almost as non-transparent as artificial intelligence. You just have this very, very large That's number right. of variants and they don't tell you a shit. <laughs> your, your, uh, what you responded was what I had in my back mind. And that's why I formulated exactly that, that why, what with the polygenic things. And, and I totally agree with you that, that understanding more about the rare variants, the pathways that are involved might be, might be quite helpful. 
to move forward. Sure, but that is uh, remains to be seen. And I, I know um, you know sure. I didn't present anything on that today, but in like autism, I think there has been highly successful to to take. No syndromes. You discover new uh, genetic syndromes, mm -hmm. and then you can take them out of the non uh, kind of uh, objective measure uh, uh, diagnostic groups and put them into specific syndromes. And there you can start uh, improving um, uh, treatments. But that is quite uh, you know a long uh, way to go, uh, and and uh, because you know what will be the treatment there to, to treat autism. That is, is really a, a big challenge. But then also in, we know that there are people, the, the most uh, sort of clinically relevant cases are you know, the, what Kauri talked about also with the CNV carriers. Mm -hmm. They have a very severe outcome and it, there will, there's a lot of clinical benefit in in identifying them, but for, for screen, no, I, I'm thinking about if you have a hospital screening everyone coming in the door, uh, the the sort of um, usefulness of of uh, screening for those variants, I think, is lower because there's so few. I'll I'd like to. Oh, uh, Arno, were you finished? No, 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 I'm finished. Um, Red Stefansson, uh, did you have a comment question? Um, the slide you showed only uh, where you combined the uh, um, the polygon risk from uh, uh, the G-buses for Alzheimer's and uh, using the MRI data for uh, predicting outcome in, in Alzheimer's, there was a massive difference. I think it was the second last slide. So uh, the, uh, did I understand it correctly that you were not using the MRI uh, together with the, with the uh, uh, risk prediction from uh, from the GVAS for Alzheimer's, were you using also the GVAS from the MRI studies? Or were you using directly the, the imaging data? Uh, good point. Uh, only first, only genetic data, then, uh, then only uh, imaging phenotypes, uh, because Imaging phenotypes are also part of, uh, since 2011 or something, part of the diagnostics. If you have smaller uh, hippocampus or something, then this is, uh, then it's a diagnostic criteria. So it, so it was not uh, imaging genetics, it was, all, it was only uh, uh, genetics and then imaging and then uh, cognitive measures. Yeah. So th th it was three modalities in a way, genetics, brain imaging, and cognitive test. Thank you. Thomas Berge, um, you are up. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich and Alex. Uh, uh, Alex, I, I, was, I was wondering, you, you've been dealing with highly polygenic traits. What if you move into traits that are let's say a little less polygenic and include something that is omnigenic as well. Uh, is that easily adapted into, in, in, into your model? And um, perhaps, I guess, slightly related to that, do you directly model homozygosity versus heterozygosity? Or, or rather, you kind of the dosage effect of these variants. So it, is it possible that a variant in, in a homozygotic uh, uh, state has one direction and the doses effect makes it go in the other direction if it's heterozygotic. So to, to the first question, I think it then even more important to what we discussed in the last question, even for the lower polygenic phenotypes with you know highly specific genetic architecture, it's important to model annotations of specific genes sort of go, go beyond the causal and non-causal notion and really have a complex uh, effect model accounting for effect size distribution and those traits. And then, then it should work. 
then the polygenicity will be lower. So still this model is a better fit than infinitesimal model, assuming that all variants are causal. But uh, I think it's important to incorporate those additional databases of pathways or genomic regions into the model. Uh, and to your second question, if I understood it correctly, perhaps I, I misunderstood, but uh, we're using the standard uh, GWAS with uh, additive effects, uh, like when the, having two alleles will be assumed have twice larger effects than one allele. If we change that into another type of GWAS that is, uh, let's say, about homozygous or heterozygous, right, more or more, like, uh, then I, it, it is compatible. But my understanding is that the, the, like the most of the summary statistics shared right now would use this additive model of genetic effects. Um, is, is I, think my, I think my point was perhaps more that when you had these opposite effect sizes, opposite, opposite direction effects in different traits, could it be that you know the, the, it's it's not the variant, it's the genotype. It's it's not the it's not the allele. It's it's the genotype that determines the direction of effect. Mm. Yeah, and and that that would be trait specific. That might be yeah. trait specific. I think we, we can easily incorporate that if we, this is a way how we run the GWAS. Okay. If uh, are there, okay. Are, are there are there? Do you have example? I can. Oh, can you imagine come up with examples? But or do you have even have? Can you imagine examples, or do you even have knowledge of, of situations where, where uh, opposite effect uh, points to biology, you know, opposite biologies as well in different traits? No, but I think that's mainly because I've only focused on uh, like the GWASs that are run with uh, standard tools. I think we could, we could run more, like every GWAS should also explore if there is a signature of those effects, which is not that I see actively discussed in the... Oh primary GWAS papers. Okay. But I mean, I guess ultimately it would be interesting to, to try to understand whether opposite effects could be, could be mapped onto to actual biologies, right? In different traits. Yes. Okay. I, I actually don't know the reason why, why it's uh, assumed like additive effects for, like that's a go-to choice for, for every GWAS. And that's also how we do right now. All the neuroimaging measures, we assume an additive effect. So having two alleles, having twice the effect of having one allele. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting to see like a test. Yeah, if, it even, if it even pointed in your direction, it would be quite crazy actually, but <laughs> leave that. Or, or just as I, uh, at least my final question, you talked about translation and this is kind of a it's never ending story. <laughs> I think in Scandinavia or in the Nordics that how do we share data and, and uh, and so do you think it's possible to come down with, uh, and you said about, you know, could we, you even took this one step further that not only for research, but also for, for trial implementation of some of these prediction tools. So do you think it would be easier to, to, to instead of sharing data for research, actually share data from, from uh, implementation, trial implementations? Is that an easier uh, domain in which to work together? Uh, I, I think uh, there's definitely a more pressure on the on getting things done if we can show clinical relevance. I think that is quite important. Uh, we are still uh, a bit, um, you know, in research we are making, imagining this will happen and stuff, but as soon as we have something that is actionable, I think then there will be a much um, easier way to establish these systems like they have in, what do you call it, transplantational uh, surgery because they have a list of people who are donors and stuff and that is really sort of... Uh, keeping you uh, saving your life you know and I think this is uh, but in research you know uh, I think we can use this uh, the, 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 in the Nordic region we have this uh, Trykve system uh, the Nordforsk uh, they developed a, a way to coordinate um, uh, analysis across different countries I know you have data in Denmark they can't be shared the same in Norway but then if we can have some kind of easy way of of uh, containers that can be sent around with standardized uh, tools standards for, for the genotypes as well as all the registry data. We're all using ICD codes and uh, it's, it's very much similar. I think that is uh, a way we can uh, 
get things up to speed and that we already have before we because waiting for legislation and all kind of future uh, i think that's a bit risky what has been the stumbling stone in terms of using these containers then you think i mean uh, at least from my own very limited hands-on experience at least uh, that that's very limited I imagine there's a lot of, uh, you know, data handling laundry before you actually use data. And, you know, that that type of work might actually be the, the, the vast majority of, the, of it. And so could, could it be that some of the problems in terms of sharing data also using containers is actually that the workload is, is, is somewhere else than where we think it is? Yes, in some ways, but I think uh, the big genetic studies have, have shown people how you need to collaborate, you need to standardize, you need, if you want to find anything, you need to have uh, uh, standardized data, standardized tools, and I think this will also come, we need to do that in the Nordic region, because it, I, I think that is easier than getting the parliament to, to sort of share data. And I think sure. that is, uh, and and, uh, and it's more. I, I think it's more like the setting, the thinking that you need to get to that level. And it's also a bit about how we structure the research. If we have like one PhD student doing one project, that's never going to happen. You need some kind of investment in the infrastructure to get up to a level, and then the PhD student can use this uh, infrastructure to get much more interesting data than sitting alone in their own sort of compartment with much smaller sample size. Yeah, I think, I think the point I was trying to get at is that what we've been sharing today until now, we have mostly been uh, very simple structured data, right? Uh, a zero one for a diagnosis and a set of standardized uh, SNP sets or CMEs in some cases. And my, my point is just that more clinically relevant data like treatment response and, and, and or severity and stuff like that actually requires a lot of pre, you know, pre-handling of, of, of even, even structured register data before it can be analyzed in a combined manner. And that kind of pre-analysis might vary considerably between countries. And that might be one of the, you know, one of the things that we should work to harmonize uh, how do you yeah. how do you facilitate the fact that we for the complicated phenotypes need to do some prior work that we didn't have to do for the diagnosis? Yeah, oh, I completely agree. It's so much easier to share yes no diagnosis than uh, some kind of fine tuned uh, uh, thought or emotional assessments and even cognitive. Uh, variation it is really hard to agree on the different tools and the specific uh, variables but i think this has to be uh, there's no way around it i think if we want to get progress especially in in uh, mental illness like in diabetes it's uh, i think there are less complicated you know you can measure glucose uh, there's um, uh, hb1ac you can uh, there's some more specific markers or in uh, heart disease you can measure pulse and uh, well, you know there but they're more uh, the, the, the core phenotypes in mental illness is not easily standardized that's uh, I, I i totally agree and then that's also uh, i think a limitation for the electronic health records, you know, uh, uh, if you want to have uh, text mining and it's very difficult to sort of one psychiatrist write this and another one that, then it's very hard to synchronize it. But there I'm not so sure if, if uh, other disciplines are, are better. So I think that is more like a general uh, problem with, with uh, sort of uh, information from uh, electronic health records beyond uh, the core phenotypes as you talk about. Can I, can I just, uh, I want to jump in. We're getting very close to the end and I wanted to at least acknowledge that uh, um, that Paul Neustad uh, had uh, sent in a, a question uh, that we didn't get to as we were going through the panel. And in some ways, this is what you've been talking about with Thomas. Um, so I'll, I'll read it. We'll give you a chance if you'd like to respond. He 
he says, Ulla, an odds ratio of 27 is really impressive. And it's, I don't remember which of your slides that he's referring to there. Still, it is not diagnostic. How can one move this odds ratio even higher? Do you think variants of intermediate prevalence and effect are important? Or do you think adding deeper phenotypes will be more important? I think both. <laughs> I think we need uh, to cover more of the risk variants uh, and also build uh, rare variants into, into the models. And then if we could add even more like deep phenotypes, exactly what uh, Thomas was talking about, then we can have other different profiles. Is it the speed of progress? Is it the different sort of cognitive profiles? Is it the, uh, there, there's this overlap with uh, like depression and, and developing uh, neurodegenerative diseases? So I think uh, this is more like a starting point of building models. It's been very like, I do genetics, nothing else. I do imaging, nothing else. I, um, I only do cognitive, nothing else. But in merging these and getting some kind of that into the our pipeline. I think that is what this illustrates. So it's not the end, it's, it's just only the beginning. I think of the end or the end of the beginning. <laughs> for sure. Are there, are there any uh, other burning questions from the panel for uh, Alex or Ole you know, in the last minute or two? Otherwise we can let them go. Well, I will say thanks to uh, uh, to Alex and Ulla for uh, preparing the presentations and to the panelists for attending and for Nico for keeping us uh, organized and on schedule and uh, making everything work more or less correctly. And I uh, look forward to the next webinar, which uh, will be with uh, Lily Milani in May. And uh, we'll uh, see you then. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.